can't believe it's happened. Everyone's going to miss him too much. The following stories tell the tale of strange photos with a horrifying secret. The people in the picture were about to commit a foul murder. Today's story begins in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's a quiet town built in the 1960s and home to one of the oldest populations in the States. In fact, there are close to zero activities for the younger generation. There's no downtown, no beach, and all parks close down at night. At 1.15 p.m. on July 16, 2011, Tyler Hadley posted a status on Facebook. Party at my crib tonight, maybe. Tyler was 17 at the time and living with his parents, Mary Jo and Blake. But Tyler's best friends thought he was bluffing when he made that house party invitation. That's because Blake and Mary Jo had just grounded Tyler for his alcohol and drug abuse. There was no way they would let Tyler throw a huge house party after all he'd done in the previous months. In fact, one of Tyler's friends texted him to ask if the party was indeed happening. He replied, I don't know, man, I'm working on it. At 8.15 p.m., Tyler posted once more on Facebook, party at my house, HMU. One of his friends asked, what if your parents come home? And he replied, they won't, trust me. That's because Tyler had just murdered both his parents with a hammer. Blake and Mary Jo Hadley had worried about their son for years. Mary Jo had been diagnosed with chronic depression as a teenager, and unfortunately, Tyler was diagnosed with the same before he was 10 years old. By the time he was 15, Tyler had been prescribed Lexapro, Adderall, Prozac, and hormone medication for his thyroid. Soon enough, he was addicted to illegal drugs too. His friend, Marky, would say Tyler, drank heavily and smoked pot and popped pills like a madman. Monkeys, beans, zannies, bars, french fries, yellow zannies. In high school, Tyler showed several signs of troubling behavior. At school, he was quiet, approaching nonverbal, though occasionally prone to sudden, nonsensical outbursts in class. Tyler's parents took him to a psychiatrist and turned to a substance abuse program for help. But again, none of these seemed to work. In April 2011, just as Tyler turned 17, he was arrested and sent to jail for one week for aggravated battery and arson. After he got out, Tyler drove home under the influence and Mary Jo was at her wit's end. She took away his car and phone. Tyler fumed. He told his best friend, Michael Mandel, that he wanted to kill his mom. Michael just thought it was something an angry teenager would say. He never thought Tyler would go through with it. After he told me I didn't believe him because he's been my best friend forever, I would never suspect anything like this. But on July 16th, 2011, Tyler decided it was time to go through with his plans. With his older brother Ryan away for college and his parents alone in their house, Tyler felt this was the right time to express his anger over his parents' restrictions. First, he took an ecstasy pill. Then he took away his parents' phones, this way they couldn't call for help. Then he found a hammer in the garage. While Mary Jo sat at the computer, Tyler stared at the back of her head for five minutes. Then he swung the hammer. Mary Jo turned and screamed, why? Blake, hearing the screams, ran into the room. Desperate, Blake asked his son the same question. Tyler shouted back, why the f not? Then he beat his father to death. After killing his parents, Tyler dragged their bodies into their bedroom. He cleaned up the crime scene, tossing the bloody towels and Clorox wipes onto the bed. Finally, he invited his friends over for a party. By midnight, 60 people were at Tyler's house. 
Most of these teenagers didn't know Tyler, but again, this was a small town where nothing happened, and it was the summer holiday. No one at the party had any idea what had happened earlier that day. Tyler's parents were lying dead in their bedroom, and 60 people were partying downstairs, jumping on furniture and putting out cigarettes in the sofa and carpets. Of course, a few of Tyler's friends asked where his parents were. They went to Georgia, he told Mark Andrews. They're in Orlando, he told Ryan Stonecipher. They don't live here, he told Richard Walters. This is my house. But as the effects of the pills were wearing out, Tyler was starting to panic. At around 1 a.m., Tyler dragged his best friend Michael outside so they could speak privately. There he told Michael, I kissed my parents. Michael's reaction was, yeah, right. But Tyler insisted. His parents' car was parked out front, for starters. But Michael still didn't believe him. And I was looking around. He told me if I look at enough, I can see signs. I looked on the floor, I could see signs of blood. And that's when I went around back and looked in his parents' bedroom. When he got to the master bedroom, Michael finally understood the gravity of the situation. But he didn't leave the party. In fact, he even took a selfie with Tyler. After I found his parents, I knew it was going to be the last time I seen him. This is that look on his face. You could see the horror on his, in his face. That's not normal, Tyler. That night, Tyler wanted to party till sunrise and then take his own life via Percocet pills. When one of his friends, Ricardo, left, he thanked Tyler for the party. I just wanted to do something fun before I left, said Tyler. Where are you going? I'm going to kill myself, said Tyler. Why would you do that? Because I did something really bad. As people were leaving the party, Tyler wanted to make it last longer. At 4.40 a.m., he posted another message on Facebook. Party at my house again, HMU. But the police were at his front door. Michael had called the Crime Stoppers hotline and told them everything, just after taking away Tyler's Percocet pills. In March of 2014, Tyler was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He appeared ridden with depression and guilt in front of the judge. Not a single day goes by that I don't think about my parents or my whole family. Although what Tyler did is no short of a horror story, the questions of his severe mental health issues were never addressed during the trial. He had been on antidepressants since he was 10 and an enormous amount of prescription drugs throughout his teenage years. Add illegal drugs on top, and that's a certain recipe for disaster. With Tyler behind bars for the rest of his life, perhaps this would be a good time to discuss the consequences of mentally unstable teens mixing prescription drugs with pills and alcohol. I'd like to direct this to my entire family. All everyone, all This next story takes us to Colleen, Texas in 1991. It was National Bosses Day on October 16th at lunchtime. Many people were out for lunch with their coworkers and bosses celebrating the day. Many of these people were at Lubby's Cafeteria, a popular buffet chain in Texas. It was about 12.45 p.m. when they heard a loud crash and saw glass flying everywhere. George Hennard had just driven his pickup truck through the front window of the cafeteria. People thought it was an accident, maybe the driver was DUI or had simply lost control of his car. We heard this crash and saw the pickup come through, and we thought he'd had a heart attack or his brakes had failed him or something. But then, Hennard came out of the car holding two guns and proceeded to shoot 50 people. He killed 23 and wounded 27 others. In 1991, this was the worst shooting in U.S. history. Hennard gunned everyone down, all the while shouting, all women of Colleen and Belton are vipers. This is what you've done to me and my family. This is what Bell County did to me. This is payback day. He cursed the women hiding under the tables and shot them dead. The only woman he let escape was the one holding the baby. 
He told her, you with the baby, get out before I change my mind. As he was looking for his next victims, Tommy Vagan was huddled on the floor beside a window. He threw himself through the window, creating an escape route for dozens of others. When the police arrived, Bernard started a shootout. The police shot him three times. He tried to retreat, but he was badly wounded. And he only had one bullet left. He shot himself in the head. With the whole town in shock and grieving, people wanted to know who the murderer was, but the police couldn't disclose any information. Have you investigated along those lines to see if he had been in recent criminal trouble or recent problems in court? I'm sure the investigators handling the case are very confident and they will follow those lines. But soon, the media uncovered the story behind George Hennard. Police have not released that name yet, but News Channel 10 has obtained it. The gunman has been identified as George Kennard. Birth date, October 15, 1956. He turned 35 yesterday. Kennard had a difficult relationship with his parents growing up. His father was described as tyrannical, and his parents would fight so bad it would often get physical. He never made any friends. His family would move around a lot, and George couldn't seem to settle down himself after he parted ways with his parents. After graduating from high school, he enrolled in the Navy where he served for two years. He then joined the Marines where his colleagues would notice his extremely angry and misogynistic behavior. In 1989, he was fired for possession of marijuana. From then on, he only took menial jobs and wouldn't last more than a few months in one place. Bernard never had a relationship either. All his life, he hated his mother and that led him to hating all women. In June 1991, he visited the FBI and told an officer that diabolical women are trying to ruin his life, spying on him and spreading rumors so that he can't get a job. Around the same time, he was stalking two sisters, 23-year-old Jill Fritz and 19-year-old Jana. That summer, he sent them a five-page letter saying, please give me the satisfaction of someday laughing in the face of all those mostly white, treacherous female vipers from those two towns who tried to destroy me and my family. You think the three of us can get together someday? His paranoia had reached a breaking point. Throughout the summer of 1991, Hennard became obsessed with the San Yzardo McDonald's massacre in 1984, watching documentaries about it on repeat. Just like that shooter, Nard wanted to go down in a shootout with the police. On October 16th, just after his 35th birthday, George wrote on his calendar, life has become a stalemate. There's simply no hope and not a prayer. After the shooting, the town of Killeen was in shock for a long time. Usually after a mass shooting, people advocate heavily against guns. But in this case, one of the survivors, Susanna Hupp, worked hard to obtain a law to carry a gun. I was there with my parents, and uh, making a long story short, my father went at the guy because he felt like he had to do something. And um, he was shot in the chest. I was able to get out. My mother stayed with my father, and eventually Hennard got around to her. And uh, so we, my brother and sister and I lost both our parents that day. Susie had a gun in her car, but was afraid to bring it into the restaurant for fear that she'd lose her chiropractor's license. Susie eventually became a house representative in Texas and continued to speak up for guns until her retirement in 2007. What do you think? Should people carry guns in order to protect themselves, or is this exactly the type of law that lets criminals do horrifying deeds, such as George Hennard's? This last story takes us all the way to Carlisle, UK. It's a county of 7,500 people in the northern part of the country, close to Scotland and loaded with beautiful architecture. In 2005, Carlisle was the home to Jordan Watson. He was a 14-year-old boy with a passion for football and a lot of friends. 
He was protective of his younger siblings and had a girlfriend the same age as him. But one thing that kind of set Jordan apart from other boys his age was that he'd actually made a couple of friends who were several years older than him. One of these friends was George Thompson, who was 19 at the time. Apparently, George had first approached Jordan in his neighborhood and the two quickly became best buddies, with Jordan naturally hooking up to his older friend. Jordan often went to George's house, playing video games with George's other friends, Ron Finley and Daniel Johnston. But there were several things wrong with this group. George sold illegal drugs and weapons and had manipulated Jordan into helping him out with the sales. The extra cash Jordan made from this work surely appealed to a 14-year-old. But it gets even creepier. George became obsessed with Jordan's 14-year-old girlfriend. Despite her constant rejection, George continued to make advances towards her whenever Jordan was out of the room. George never understood the message, and on June 15, 2015, he and his friends would destroy her and Jordan's lives forever. Jordan was at his family's home with his girlfriend when he received a phone call at around 11 p.m. It was George who was asking for Jordan's help with one of his deals. Apparently, George was about to sell weapons to a man in the local cemetery. Although this sounded odd, Jordan did agree to go and meet George. In the cemetery were George, Ron, and Daniel. Ron and Daniel had no idea about George's plan. In fact, Ron was also asked to help George with his deal, and he'd brought Daniel along because he was afraid of being in a cemetery at night. At 11.30 p.m., a woman in the neighborhood heard three long, terrifying screams. The voice, she said, belonged to a child or a young teenager. The last scream was the loudest and lasted for 15 seconds. George stabbed and beat Jordan to death. But that was not the end of his horrific plan. This message made zero sense to her. Jordan hadn't given any signs about not being happy with her. Furthermore, the message had a lot of spelling mistakes. This was unlike Jordan. First, she thought it was a prank by George. She knew Jordan was with him and she figured she'd just sleep it off and speak to Jordan about it in the morning. But she would never speak to or see Jordan again. At 7.45 a.m., a woman was walking her dog around the cemetery when she found Jordan's body. She called the police, and immediately they started an investigation. DS Andrew Slattery described the attack as savage and brutal. He said, For anyone to die in these circumstances is appalling, but this premeditated murder was carried out on a small 14-year-old boy. Jordan was an ordinary 14-year-old boy like hundreds of others growing up in Carlisle. To his family, Though he wasn't ordinary, he was unique. He was their son and brother, and they loved him. It didn't take long for the police to figure out that George had lured Jordan into the cemetery the night before. When they went to his home, they found a blood-stained Kirka knife under his bed. The police also recovered a machete, a clever, a stun gun, a replica rifle, and a block of knives which George kept next to his bed. As Braun and Daniel also participated in the attack, they were arrested and charged alongside George. George and Braun were convicted of Jordan's murder and given a minimum of 27 and 14 years respectively. Daniel was found guilty of manslaughter and given 10 years in prison. But no amount of prison time will bring closure to Jordan's family. Uh, it's a nightmare, like, can't believe it's happened. It's too sudden. Everyone's going to miss him too much. What's worse is that George showed no remorse for his horrible attack. The judge told him at the trial, There is no word to describe what you did other than evil. After you had committed the murder, you were without guilt or remorse. The next day you got up and had a driving lesson. You then went to work as normal. There is evidence that you surfed the internet looking for stories about the murder, and you actually enjoyed the coverage. 
All Jordan's family can do now is remember him as the fun, kind boy he was. Every day we question why the life of our 14-year-old child was taken in such a cruel and violent way. We will never see our child grow up and live a full life. What do you think about these cases? Let me know what you think down in the comment section. And before you go, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to the channel. Sleep tight.